organization. So let's welcome Joao Peito. Thanking the organizers uh, uh, for the invitation and also um, the, the society for, as, as you mentioned, for uh, contributing to, uh, with funds for this project that I'll tell you about. Um, this is my first uh, participation in a cryonics conference. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. So I come from the Integrative Genomics of Aging Group at University of Liverpool. And as the name implies, we work mostly on aging. Um, I'll tell you just briefly, brief introduction to what my interests are in, uh, in cryonics, uh, what I think some of the problems are. And then I'll tell you about what we're doing in terms of functional genomics of cryoprotection and toxicity. And in the end, I'll tell you some ideas about um, how I think it would be useful to have a, a cryonics company in Europe with uh, local storage, and specifically in the UK. Um, so I, I guess this is a bit like pushing to the converted, but you know, you know that um, I, it, it does strike me that most people in our societies um, make their peace with death, and well, most of them don't even think about death until quite late on. Um, I guess in that sense, I was a little bit different because when even when I was a child, so that's me when I was um, quite younger than now. Um, and uh, so I realized that I was going to die, and um, very few people uh, paid any attention to it. Uh, and I was going to age, and probably I was going to die of aging. Um, and that's when I decided to work on aging. I decided I was going to cure aging um, as part of my career. And of course, my parents told me that was going to be really impossible. Um, but I thought, well, it doesn't matter, you know, people. 50 or 100 years ago didn't think that infectious diseases could be cured like they can be cured now with antibiotics. So I'll just do the same thing for aging. And so what I've done ever since is, is really, uh, I won't go into great details, but I, I've developed an academic career um, in, um, in the field of uh, aging. Um, so I did a PhD, I'll mention cellular senescence and stress because that's quite relevant to the project we've been doing, um, and also done a number of works on uh, genomics. And so now I, I lead the, the Integrative Genomics of Aging group, and we do a combination of experimental work, in particular at the level of cell and molecular biology, um, and we do a, a lot of work on genomics and the genetics of aging uh, from cells, model organisms, um, trying to do some work with uh, human data as well more recently. Um, and the ultimate goal, although what we do is basic research, the ultimate goal uh, would be to, um, to develop life-extending interventions and really ultimately would be to cure or help cure aging. Now, of course, that, that's probably not that simple, and uh, I think it's unlikely that aging will be cured in my lifetime. Um, there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, so this is actually a little bit of what Aubrey mentioned today, uh, this first paper, which is now in press in Cell Cycle, and it's basically what Aubrey said um, about these extraordinary findings in model systems in terms of extending lifespan are very unlikely to have such strong effects in human beings. I think he mentioned that probably these lifespan effects will be only a couple of percent in human beings, and I would agree with it. I think there is a lot of problems in translating the modulation of aging in model systems into human beings. Uh, I mean, the, this goes into more detail um, into it. So I do think that a lot of the field of aging research is I wouldn't say misdirected because this is at least something we can do, but um, I would say it's not very ambitious in terms of its outcomes for, for human beings. Um, and I also think that, so I have this also this other paper in press in Aubrey's uh, journal, Rejuvenation C Research, where I say that, you know, I'm certainly optimistic about uh, advances in aging and, you know, companies like Human Longevity Incorporated and Calico in contributing to it, uh, advances in technologies, um, but it is unlikely that we will develop the interventions to cure aging, particularly because, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in cells. Um, I guess I'll mention it in just a, a couple of minutes. There's a lot of things you can do in cells and a lot of research you can do and a lot of interventions you can do in cells and even in model systems, but turning those into human beings is a very, very big step and it's a very difficult step in which a lot of therapies fall. And so I think it's unlikely we're going to be curing aging in my lifetime. It's not impossible, and, and I hope I'm wrong. But let's assume it's not. Um, so what is the backup plan? And as you might have guessed it, it's cryonics. Um, I've been intrigued for cryonics for a number of years. Uh, I think it's the choice between dying in eternal oblivion and a possible, even if unlikely, future revival. I would rather go for the cryonics. Um, I do think that 
current protocols and the way it currently works, and Ben did a wonderful um, overview of the current state of the field, I do think it has a lot of limitations, as, as Ben mentioned. Um, so for full disclaimer, I don't sign up to cryonics. I'm not, don't, I don't intend to sign up for cryonics anytime soon. Um, but I am intrigued by the idea. Um, the reason I don't intend, even if I were to find out tomorrow that I have disease that's gonna kill me in six months, um, I probably have the money for cryonics, but I don't know if I would rather leave, you know, 100 or 200,000 dollars, how much it costs, uh, to my daughters than to use it for myself in something that I have very serious reservations. Um, on the bright side, however, I do think that most of the problems that Ben mentioned with cryonics and that you're aware of can be overcome with, you know, standard research. Uh, the big problem is that there's very little research on cryonics. But if we were to employ just existing technologies to research cryonics and to improve the methodologies, I, I do think this would be achievable. Uh, and this is actually in contrast with aging, because aging, in order to cure aging, you actually need to develop new technologies, because what's possible now is drug development, which will have modest effect, as I mentioned and as Oberst mentioned. So we need new technologies to actually intervene in a great extent in aging. Uh, while in cryonics, I do think we could intervene in uh, or, or develop adequate protocols with existing cryonics. Uh, I'm sorry, with existing technologies and the applications of existing technologies. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you what we've done so far. Um, so I guess Ben already introduced that you know there's a number of cryoprotectant agents um, to block ice formation, but these are also toxic, and that is a major problem in uh, uh, in cryopreservation and in cryonics. Um, it's one of, uh, it, its mechanisms by and large are poorly understood. Um, and so what we did, and so this was done with funding from Longer City and also a crowdfunding effort, which I guess the single biggest supporter was the German Society for Applied Biostasis, for which we're very thankful. Um, we decided to do a, a small project on functional genomics for, uh, of cryopreservation. And so we've done this in cells. Uh, we chose human vascular endothelial cells, um, the reason being First of all, they're available, you can buy them from companies, they grow well in culture, uh, and they are critical for, for um, nearly all tissues, all vascularized tissues. Uh, and they're also important in protection against perfusion injury. Um, so we focus on human vas uh, vascular endothelial cells, and we also focus on ethylene glycol, um, basically because, so it's widely used and also there seems to be more information about the MSO than about, about the mechanism of the MSO than about ethylene glycol, so we focus on that glycolin, ethylene glycol. And we did a protocol, so this is done in cell culture, um, so in a Petri dish you have your cells, and we do a gradual um, addition of, uh, of the cryoprotectin, in this case ethylene glycol, till we have about 60% concentration uh, with 40% um, LM5, which was provided by 21st century medicine. And I should say, so um, the people who did this work, so I guess Soren, uh, and I started it, but then most of the experiments were done by Hui, who's a research assistant in our lab. Um, and we're very thankful to uh, Gregory Fahe and Brian Wong for very useful advice and also for providing the LM5 solution uh, and also to Alexandra Stolzing for um, useful suggestions. Um, now, one of the things I should say is, of course, so um, I think we got $12,000 for this experiment, uh, which is great for us to begin with, but it is a relatively modest amount. So, I guess in an ideal world, we would do multiple cell lines, we would do multiple uh, time points, we would do multiple concentrations of cryoprotectant, and we would do multiple cryoprotectants. That would be the ideal experiment. Uh, but of course, that's not possible, and so we had to focus on one concentration, um, one uh, cryoprotectant, one cell line, and only two time points. Uh, although uh, I thought this concentration was actually quite high, it was actually higher than I thought the cells would uh, undertake. Uh, it was only possible with the LM5. If we use, um, well, before we got LM5, we couldn't get such high concentration, so that was really helpful. Um, and as I said, that was more than I thought we would be able to use. Um, and so the experiment consisted, we had three groups of cells. Um, we just had, so we had our normal controls or, or, or negative controls, which are cells that we leave in the incubator. Um, then we have the cell with the cryoprotectant. So these are cells that we gradually add the cryoprotectant. We put it at, uh, in the fridge for, so we don't actually vitrify the cells because we're interested in just in the toxicity mechanisms. Put it in the fridge for I think two hours, if I remember correctly. Then we take it out, we gradually remove the cryoprotectant, uh, also with trellos, uh, and then we put it back in the incubator at 20, um, uh, sorry, at 37 degrees. 
And we also have a call control, which is essentially the same as this group, only it doesn't have any cryoprotectin. So it basically has um, uh, LM5 and trailers, but not the cryoprotectin. And we did two time points, 24 and, 40 and 72 hours. Um, again, this was a bit of a guess. Uh, we, we could only afford two uh, sorry, two time points. Um, and this was similar to what I did during my PhD when I did uh, oxidative stress uh, experiments in cell lines as well. Um, and so the first thing we looked at is the cell growth, um, as you'd expect. When, it, when you put the cells in the cold, um, it reduces their proliferation, uh, which is what I observed. So you have the normal controls where I kept at 37 degrees, cold controls were put in the fridge for two hours, um, and then the experimental group with the cryoprotectin. And this is what you would expect. You have less cells because of the cold, and you also have a little bit less cells because of the cryoprotectin itself. But as you can see, it's not a massive effect from here to here, uh, which again surprised me a little bit in the sense that I thought the cryoprotectin would be more toxic at 60%. I thought 60% was already quite a high uh, concentration. Um, I mean, then what we did was we did a, a microarray for measuring gene expression levels. I know many of you are not biologists, so I'll ex briefly explain what this means. Um, so, so essentially, um, proteins, which are the, the machines of life that, that determine our traits and you know, are involved in all of the cellular functions and processes, they're in turn encoded by genes in the genome. Um, it's really difficult to, or it's more difficult than expected to quantify proteins. So what you do, you do gene expression probes, so you quantify whether more protein is being produced um, in, for example, in a particular conditions. And so that's what a microarray does. Uh, so this is a microarray, and each of these dots, um, so this is actually a little bit of a microarray, each of these dots is a different gene, um, and by how bright it is allows you to quantify the gene expression levels. And if you have a gene that is a very high expression level, for example, in, in in a cold control, um, what that means is, uh, is that it's producing more protein. And probably the protein levels are also higher um, because there's a correlation between them, although it's not perfect. Um, so we did the measured gene expression, these different concentrations, and this is, I mean, we did, you do a number of, so you measure this for all genes in the genome, which is in total actually is about 40,000 genes because there's things called known coding genes. Uh, I'm not going to go into great methodological details. You do a number of statistical approaches, and then you find which genes are going up or down in your different conditions. And so when you compare the cryoprotectin to the cold control, uh, for example, at uh, 24 hours, there's uh, 118 genes going up, 257 going down, statistically significant, and a 72, the C18 going up and 89 going down. Um, and then what you can do is, so, you know, uh, so all our results are actually available on our website. Um, but, you know, if you have a few hundred genes, uh, um, there's not much point in just looking through those 300 genes. So what you do is something called functional enrichment, which is you, you look for genes that belong to similar functions. So, for example, if among these 300, or, sorry, if among the 118 genes upregulated, there's 100 genes involved in DNA repair, then you can say that there is an upregulation of DNA repair mechanisms and pathways. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and what we find um, that is statistically significant, or I, I think the top ones, I think there's maybe a few more, but these were the top ones we found, um, is you found a, a lot of signaling pathways. So you find signaling peptides, and so these will find bonds you generally find on, actually, on a lot of signaling peptides, so that's why it's there. So you find different categories of genes involved in uh, particular processes. Um, although, as you can see, these are quite broad. So you find signaling peptides, you find genes that are ex Ex, um, sorry, associated proteins that are um, associated with, uh, they are secreted and um, involved in extracellular space, and you find uh, transmembrane proteins. Uh, and going down, you have more signaling pathways, um, so genes, receptors related to signaling pathways, uh, which is what you see here. Um, then you have GTPases and ATPases. Uh, they're also uh, going down at 24 hours. Um, so you, what essentially, these are relatively broad categories, and what I suggest is that there's signaling pathways that are being activated and downregulated when you do the cryoprotectant. So this is only comparing the cryoprotectant to the cold control. Um, and then at 72 hours, what you see is you have fewer genes, and you have most of these genes are the same at 24 hours, only um, fewer of them, and with a lower expression. Um, so really at 72 hours, so what you can say is that there's an acute 
stress at 24 hours because of the crowd protecting, and then at 72 hours, um, there's more residual effects. There's a recovery and there's more residual effects. And so as you can see, for example, amongst upregulated genes, um, at those upregulated 72 hours, with one exception, all of them are also genes upregulated at 24. Um, so what you see is really a cell recovery at 72 hours, in which even the genes that are being up and down regulated, they tend to, um, even if they're still down regular at 72 hours, so this is zero, this is 24, this is 72, and from 7, 24 to 22, they tend to converge to zero, essentially, even upregulated and downregulated genes. So that's what you see, you see a cell recovery at 72 hours. Um, and you see processes at 72 hours um, associated with this recovery, things like um, wound, wheeling, sorry, wound, wound um, healing, um, response to organic substances, which, which you'd expect because it's ethylene glycol, etc. cetera. Um, and also in downregulated, you have a number of signaling pathways. Um, so what does this all mean? Um, so, I mean, my interpretation, and again, and I'm ho happy to receive suggestions and thoughts, is that, so first of all, I thought it was interesting that human vascular and ethylic cells can survive up to 60% um, ethylene glycol. Again, that was more than I was expected. I think in part it's because of LM5, which I thought was very helpful. Um, the second point about the gene expression profiles, it does reveal a generalized stress response um, and an alteration of number of signaling pathways uh, and then a recovery at 72 hours. Um, this fits very well with what we see. Um, but it does have the problem that it's quite difficult, well, so far we found it not possible to pinpoint specific genes or specific mechanisms involving cryoprotecting toxicity. Um, and that's a bit disappointing. Um, now, so all, the, but all of the results are online, so you can get a full list of genes. Um, and you know, anyone who knows more about uh, cryoprotectants uh, than I do, uh, please feel free to uh, have a look and let me know if there's anything that uh, you find could be uh, potentially useful to us. Um, I, uh, yes, so all of our data is online, uh, at least the raw results. I don't think the functional enrichment is. But if you want more, if you want a functional enrichment, also email me and I'll, I'll be happy to provide it. Um, <clears throat> so, in the last five minutes, um, I wouldn't focus more on um, efforts for local storage in the UK. Um, so this is what I showed you earlier. That, I mean, choice between eternal oblivion and future revival. I would be keen to choose future revival, provided that I'm convinced that this could work. Um, but the other point is that if we can, if we could show that this, is, this could be successful, I think it would really uh, help attract a lot of people to it, and it could have even commercial uh, potential. So one of the things that, um, and this was, I have to blame my former student Soren Sterling for a bit convincing me of this. Um, so I, I actually think there would be a market for a UK or maybe even European uh, cryonics company with local storage. I, I, and I think it would also help focus the efforts of that group in that particular local storage. So as you probably are aware, or maybe, well, maybe not everyone is aware. So Alan Sinclair, um, which I think Ben mentioned earlier today. So he actually opened a facility in Eastbourne in 1989. Um, but he told me, I, I talked to him about two weeks ago when he told me that he gave up over about 15 years due to lack of interest. Um, and as far as I know, very few people have been suspended in the UK um, in the past 30 years. Uh, I think they also had some issues with uh, you know, having the adequate skills and expertise. Um, as far as I know, they never actually kept anyone there. Um, that's as far as I know. So there was this one effort um, about creating uh, local storage in the UK. Um, and I think that would be really useful um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that, and this has been mentioned already during this uh, conference, is that we need to find this idea that death is okay. Um, and I've, I've always wondered, you know, why more atheist millionaires don't sign up to cryonics. I think it's fair, and I mean, uh, I guess Max Moore talked about this yesterday, we had a discussion yesterday, um, that there's peer pressure, there's, I think there's issues, a lot of issues with the reputation of cryonics. I mean, people don't really believe it's gonna work. Um, myself, I'm probably a little bit on the edge on that one, actually. Um, and people also believe it's embarrassed, and I mean, there, there's this urban myth 
I don't know if it's true or not, that people are more afraid to be embarrassed than they are of dying. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I certainly think that's true for, for a lot of people. Uh, and so if you think you're gonna be embarrassed by saying you're gonna do cryonics, then maybe you uh, I think a lot of people were out or not. Uh, and as you, again, been discussed yesterday, a lot of people make their peace with death, uh, either religion, but even non-religious people, quite a few do that. Um, but if we could change that, even if in a small fraction of the population, I think it would be tremendous benefit both for cryonics and for life extension research because as, uh, as, as Aubrey mentioned, the overall idea of cryonics or the, the concept of cryonics and of curing aging, they share the same ideology that you know, death is bad for you. Um, but I would say I, I find it, so I also do some outreach work and I give talks to you know, convince people of life extension technologies that, and if it's important. Um, I mean, certainly not as much as Aubrey, but I, I do quite a bit as well. Uh, and I find it quite difficult. I think people with life extension, um, there's always this concern about overpopulation. There's always this concern about um, uh, how just it's going to be. Um, it is, there's a number of social and global concerns in the minds of people that make it difficult to sell, I think, the concept of life extension. Some people already accept it. I think there's more people accepting it than, than 20 years ago, but it's still difficult. I do think that fighting death is, would be easier from a cryonics angle because it's more personal. You're not talking about the global scenario. You're talking, would you like to die or would you like to have a chance to maybe live in the future? So from that perspective, I think it would be easier. Um, so. I, I think it would be really wonderful, and um, I would be very happy to be involved and help to create a, a, a local storage company. I think the key would be to have uh, adequate PR, uh, and again, the key would be to show that this is reliable in the sense that it is high tech, it's based on the latest technologies, it's professional, um, so it's not just a group of friends that want to cryopreserve themselves, no, it's a group of professionals that will um, help you, just like in medical establishments. Um, I, I wonder whether we should call it something else, actually, because I do think cryonics has a kind of a poor reputation, so maybe call it, I mean, a lot of marketing companies like to do uh, labels and change um, names of something, so instead of calling cryonics, maybe calling, well, maybe biostasis, since this is organized by the Biostasis Society, um, and essentially try to market it in a more aggressive way. Um, but for that, of course, it does need to be reputed and a reliable effort. Um, I mean, I live in the UK, so obviously uh, uh, there would be advantages for me in setting this up in the UK, but uh, I know some people have been thinking about Switzerland as well, which then have the advantage of uh, being able to do elective um, cryopreservation. Um, so the point would be to one day turn it in cryonics in a, into a reasonable gamble. Um, I took this quote, um, you, you won't find out from it, it's a UK, um, thing, but um, basically um, the point is that, and I think it would be quite applicable to, uh, to cryonics, uh, is that if you have a very low chance of success, but you have nothing to lose, then you'll take that very low chance of success. And well, one of the things um, I've noticed is that people, when they have terminal diseases, they will take, be willing to pay a lot of money, and take a lot of chances and side effects to get therapies that have a very, very low chance of success. Um, so, cryonics, hopefully the idea would be to turn into something like that. You won't be able to guess. This is from a, a UK charity called Rare Disease UK, uh, which focuses on orphan diseases. I probably was looking to see if I could get some funding from them for something. That's why I came across it. And, um, but I thought it would be quite applicable to, to cryonics as well. Um, so I think that's it for me. So in summary, um, I do think we need to convince people that death is really, really bad. I mean, people know death is bad, and as I think Ben mentioned yesterday, if you put a gun to someone's head, um, they'll choose to live rather than pull the trigger in, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, but people don't think that far ahead, uh, and I do think people who accept death are deluded, mostly by religion, but for, for other reasons as well. Um, so we, we do need to convince people uh, of how bad death is. Um, then I told you about our work on uh, human vascular endothelial cells, which are um, I thought was surprisingly resistant to ethylene glycol and recover well after the exposure, as so at 72 hours you see a clear recovery, which I think is good because these are important cells in our, in our organs, and so that's important for, for cryonics. Um, 
And the functional genomics of cryoprotectin toxicity, when we do the gene expression profiles, uh, it reveals generalized stress responses, but so far nothing we can really pinpoint as the mechanism. Um, but again, any suggestions, please let me know. Uh, unless I told you that we, we do need an European or UK cryonics company to, to fight deathism, and, and I would be glad to help it may succeed. Um, so I think that's it for me. I'll, I'll tell you. So this, so this is actually Hoy. So Soren is not on this picture, but that's him hiding over there. Um, and um, th as I said, Longev City, and of course here the society provided most of the funding for this project. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Any questions? Ah, okay. It's a remark, not just to a point of your report. Uh, I wonder if anybody has tried to use endogenous cell cryoprotectants. For example, uh, block excretion of cryoprotectants by the cells, sugars, proteins, and so on, and enrich it in the cells. It, it may help uh, in cryoprotect um, I am not aware of any. I mean, Ben, mm -hmm. do you know of anything like this? I'm, I'm not aware of any. Uh, uh, but how would you do that? How would you block it? Because I think the, oh, so they're quite you can, small. You can block metabolism of uh, proteoglycans, for example. Uh, okay. And they are not ex excreted in uh, the terminal state from the cells. Okay. You, you could inhibit insulin, maybe, I don't mm. know. I, I think it's an intriguing, I, I, would, I would have to look into the biochemical, biochemistry behind yes. it to know how, how could that be done. Yes. Uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know, sorry. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I told you it's not to the point, it's only a proposal. I'll, I'll make a mental note of it. More questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I was very impressed uh, with the result of uh, uh, cryoprotect and uh, robustness of endothelial cells. Uh, maybe you know about some other uh, studies of uh, uh, cryopreservation of endothelial cells. If, if no, please say. Thank you. Uh, other to I'm not aware of this other studies on vitrification of endothelial cells from memory, I have to say I'm not. I'm, there might have been cryopreservation, just standard methods, but I'm not aware of any, sorry. Okay, there was another question right here. Yeah, actually it's more of a complaint than a question. You talked about uh, $12,000 funding and how you could have done this and could have done that. Why didn't you come and ask for money? I had this yesterday with the Russian guy saying they ran out of money, but I never heard from them. Please ask for money. We have some money. We want to give you money, lovely money. Please ask um, for money. Put in a research application, please. Can you, can you say that again so I recorded it? <laughs> um, well, certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll ask you for money. Don't worry. Um, um, th thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. So thanks again. Thank you.